Welcome back, everyone. This segment is sponsored by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. You can learn more at Tenable.com. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Matt Alderman, the Vice President of Strategy at Tenable Network Security. He's responsible for developing Tenable's long-term roadmap to include strategies for messaging, new market entries, and a whole bunch of other business words in there. Um, previously, Matt was at RSA, as we said before, responsible for enhancing the SaaS platform and policy compliance solution at Qualys. He also co-authored the Policy Compliance for Dummies. Alderman was also the founder and CTO at Control Path, where he's a co-inventor, Sean Malloy, where issued United States patent number... 7,788,150. Did I say that? Did I say that right? I, I Boom! Is that how just, you say I that? Just, I just... The numbers just rattle That's my numbers. numbers. It's 7 hard. million. I, I'm, there's no commas in there? So there's I don't commas, know. Is yeah. It, oh, yeah, there's commas million. in okay, there. Okay, I just okay. kind of... It's a method for assessing risk in, in a business. And welcome, Matt, to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So... Um, Matt, I want to start off talking a little bit about GRC, because we kind of use that acronym a lot, and I, I heard it when I came to Tenable, and at first I was like, what the hell is GRC? I never was in that space before, right? I did security for a lottery company, for a university. I never had to do this GRC and, 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 thing. And see, see, me, GRC is that company owned by Steve Gibson. That's right. Gibson Research Corporation. Corporation. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, the analysts created this thing called... Governance, risk management, and compliance. So they they took on, this. Just gonna, oh, okay, go thanks. Ahead. All right, no worries. They took three disparate kind of functions mm -hmm. and slammed them together and called it a market. Um, I hate the term. Most people who know me know that I hate the term. Um, but it's stuck um, in this concept of you need to manage governance, risk management, and compliance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started in the early days building, I was a security guy. I started in security and when Graham Leach, Bliley and HIPAA came along, there was this need to address the compliance requirements of security, mm -hmm. uh, IT controls and, and how do you Higher ups are very those. worried about that. They are. GLBA thing. And you know, this was back in the early 2000s mm -hmm. when these regulations came out and you know, I got the start early on where I, I was doing consulting for National City Bank, uh, now owned by PNC. And they didn't do a good job with their risk management program, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> There's a joke there somewhere. Yeah, there is. Go for well, it. remember, they, they, they went a little too crazy on the mortgage, the subprime mortgage, yeah. and when the market yeah. bottomed out yeah. in 2008. Yeah, they, they lost a few billion dollars and had to get bought by PNC. But that's a whole different discussion. But... When we, they had hired me to come in and say, hey, how, could, how can we manage our third-party vendors mm -hmm. from a security perspective? So I reported to information protection, and my job was manage all of our third parties for risk. And we did it with Excel spreadsheets. We did it with email. We communicated you with all the manually. big stuff. It was right? kind of, it's all manual. But it's kind of like the same thing where we'll, you know, we'll have a problem and they're like, wow, this, this takes way too long. Right. So and we'll build a tool. We need to build a tool. So right? I built a tool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had this crazy idea. Well, ah, let's build a tool. And GRC was in a space then. Uh, we were trying to solve a problem of how do you take security controls, manage them to third-party vendors, and how can you automate that process? And, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the basis for GRC. It came from either the security side trying to understand IT controls and how do you manage those, or it came from the financial side for Sarbanes-Oxley, and how mm -hmm. do you manage the financial controls? Well, the two merged together into the space called GRC. So it's this really broad market space of all things governance, risk management, and compliance. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of things that... XCCDF, did I say that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. That, well, yeah, that's SCAP, That's right? SCAP, but right. that plays into it. Like, there are it, people that are really does. big. And, yeah. I mean, there are people listening going, oh, my God, I live this, right? right, right. And there are others in security that are like, uh, what, is, what are you guys blah, talking blah, 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 about? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to three. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. La, la, when la, I came la, to la, Tenable, la, la. I, I started to gain insight into this whole thing. Well, so, when, yeah. so, when Ron, so Ron and Renault and Jack, when I interviewed to come over, they're like, you want to rebuild a GRC 
you don't you? And I'm like, no, yeah. I don't. <laughs> I want to do I've been there. I've done now. that yeah. twice, yeah. right? You know, well, because you did that with your own consulting company, and right. then you did that for um, you went to uh, RSA. Well, RSA. Well, well, you did some stuff for RSA. Yeah, there's, a, there's a little. So, there's a story there. Yeah, but, there's yeah. a story. But you know, I started my own company called Control Path. There was a spin out from Acuvant to try to build a tool, which we did. We mm-hmm. built a, a product, and took it to market and tried to solve this problem. We lost funding. We sold to Trustwave. And I ended up at Qualys. And Qualys was trying to figure out how to build a GRC light. Mm-hmm. You know, Philippe's vision was how do you take what they were doing with their policy compliance module and, and come from the bottom up and build this and not have all the heavy overhead of an Archer or, or mm-hmm. uh, these big GRC tools. That never we we had the right ideas. We not, just never got far enough from an investment right. perspective to pull it off. And Archer asked me to come over and run strategy for them and, and look at the Archer product and how do we continue to expand it. So I've been on the security GRC kind of yeah, roller, roller coaster, coaster for yeah. a number of years. So but yeah. it's essentially there's a system configured this way. It doesn't meet. The a compliant. policy. A like policy. A, a, it could, could a, be, a it, registry item needs to change. It, a configuration right. file needs to right. change. It, to it the, could you know. be. It could be a regulatory requirement. It could be just an information security policy requirement. Yeah. It was really measuring controls against policy. What I've really tried to do is kind of take that to a different level and call it system hardening, which resonates more with the security folks. Uh, a like lot when I go do a pen test, I'm like. You need to harden your systems. Yeah. It, a lot of these tools oh, that we've talked yeah, about. Oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, now you get it, how, right? How, like how this about is, this mm-hmm. term? Security configuration management. That's kind of what they... That's, that, that's kind like of, a, that's that's kind of what That's like a now. place where I can put copies of my configs, right? No. Not quite. See, that's what I see yeah, when Paul says system yeah, hardening. Yeah. I'm like, I got it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so system hardening, hardening yeah, there resonates go. with everyone. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and that's it. But my point to that is that's an important part of what we call security, right? There's people. There, I mean, there's patches. Yeah. You know, there's malware. But when you get right down to it, and it kind of segues into DevOps as well, it's, you need to have securely configured systems, and that's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and here. the GRC space was trying to a- account for management, operational, and technical controls. Security is okay. really about more technical, technical controls. controls. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's some of the management and operational controls. So what GRC tried to do is blend all that together, together. I gotcha. and say, hey, you've got a technical component. You've got management and operational controls. I need to make sure that you're complying with the management and operational mm-hmm. and the technical controls. The approach GRCs took was very different than the security providers. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, you see a lot of integrations between those products, which why there is a, some interesting there, overlap. There's a lot of challenges there because when I speak with organizations and I tell them, you need to have a secure configuration. And then you need to make sure all your systems have that secure configuration. You need to do that on an ongoing basis. Like, what are some of the, the problems there, and how do we over, overcome those? Because that's a hard thing. Yeah. And even, like, you know, Larry just pen testing full time. I've done a lot of pen testing. That's one of the things that we'll recommend. Like, dude, you need to do system hardening, and yeah. you need to do it on an ongoing basis, and that's hard. Yeah, it is. And, and it's, hard to, it's hard to consume all the data. Mm-hmm. in a way that you can manage it. And, and I think where the GRCs have struggled, to be honest, is scale. The ability to consume millions, hundreds of millions or billions of records that you're collecting through your existing tools to say, am I compliant? I, I could use questionnaires to do it, but mm-hmm. then you're waiting for a human oh, yeah, that was so to painful. self-assess yep. and say, yeah, I'm doing that. Right. When underneath the systems are like, well, you're not doing that because here's all the different misconfigurations and vulnerabilities yeah. that you have. So are you really doing it? And so there's this, there's always been this um, interesting disconnect between mm-hmm. what the GRC systems were trying to report from a self-assessment basis to what the tools were saying. So everybody said, okay, we got to integrate these data points. But it's, it's a scale issue because mm-hmm. there's just a tremendous amount of data that these tools have that the GRCs can't consume necessarily natively, uh, which is why you see a lot of interesting kind of side projects. Now, tell us about your software. It was a software patent? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was a, a patent. It was an algorithm patent. Yeah, Al- algorithm patent. And I'm sure there's others out there, you know, that are in security and technology that are listening to the show. They probably have ideas that are probably patentable, but maybe don't understand the, a little bit of the process or like. So, like, what? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the patent thing. Like, what was that like? Yeah, it was interesting. When we built it, we didn't think we were going to patent this thing at all. The the concept of 
the algorithm was how do you standardize risk? Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the way a lot of the vulnerability scanners did it in the early days, and I'm talking 2003, 4, 5, it was all about vulnerability criticality, right? I gave it a ranking 0 to 5 or whatever. Yeah. CVSS based uh, or, or CVSS based, based on their based own score. scoring system. Yeah. You know, N-Circle did some interesting stuff with a risk score that was open-ended. So mm -hmm. you could get these scores like 172,000, and it was like, what does that mean, right? So it's really we, bad or really good, depending it, on how you're scoring. Well, yeah. what, what's the normalized scale? But yeah, but is it? Exactly, until right. you know the normalized scale. Right, until you know the normalized scale. So an open-ended scale never worked. So we said, in order for us to understand whether a control deficiency, re, again, remember, GRCs were all about controls more mm -hmm. than anything else. How do you understand if a control misconfigured is risky or not risky? Mm -hmm. And so we had to figure out an algorithm that allowed us to say, based on certain criteria of the control, based on the system and the business that it was applied to, did we consider it to be a high or low or medium risk? So we created an algorithm in the control path software at the time that allowed us to calculate and roll up risk through the entire organization so that we could try to measure it and we could try to normalize it. In in all, most of the risk calculations at the time were kind of an averaging equation. So it would try to take a bunch of the stuff and average it together. And as mm -hmm. you rolled up a bunch of averages, all you did is dilute the value. And I said, well, that doesn't help because a red item down here just ends up showing green when you're way up at the top mm -hmm. because you've diluted it through a bunch of averaging equations. So we said, is there a way to solve this problem? And so we did. We created an algorithm that allowed us to account for a couple factors. One... Um, the ability to allow high risky controls to not get diluted too much. Mm -hmm. So as they got rolled up, they didn't get diluted too much. But number two, how do you bring in impact of the business? Business context is important in risk. You can't have risk if you don't understand business context and the importance of the business assets. And so you had to bring a business component into it. And so Sean Malloy and I, who, who was my chief architect, we came who up works with... works for Yeah, Tenable. he works for Tenable he now. Works for Tenable yeah, now, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Sean and I have a long <laughs> history together. Uh, so anybody who saw the press release will now start to understand the connection yeah, between yeah. bringing Sean over to, to Tenable. But Sean and I ended up embedding this algorithm into Control Path, and I was, as a founder, I was a chief technology <clears throat> officer. I, I knew my limitations. I wasn't going to be the CEO. I had a lot to learn about business back then. And so I hired our CEO, and he said, we need to patent this. Mm -hmm. We need to patent this algorithm. And so we went through the patent process. It's an interesting process. It is. A lot of lawyers. You need a patent. I was going to say you need uh, lawyers. You like need lots lawyers. of lawyers. Yeah, yeah. lots they, of lawyers. They have a really high hourly rate, too. Oh, yeah, they're expensive because suckers. Because patent but lawyers, from what I understand, have to have a degree in engineering before they can get yeah. their patent lawyer it, and it's not only it's not only building the patent package they have to do all the research to see if there's another one available so they yeah. charge you all these hours for, yeah. for the research to right. say if you can even patent the idea yes we submitted for the we actually filed for two patents under control path the algorithm was granted first mm -hmm. we had another one that sean wrote um that talked about how to structure the business we had a, a very flexible uh, business structure uh, model. Uh, I believe that patent was still pending. I haven't checked it because mm -hmm. Trustwave owns both of those patents after we sold the company. But mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting process. That's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I wanted to listen to. We haven't talked about patents on the show. As yeah, individual. you know, it's pretty cool. It's yeah. tenable. We we have ten patents. Yes. Um, PBS holds a, quite a yeah a, one or two one or two um, of those yeah, yeah. It, so we have a number of patents. So I work with our attorneys to make sure we have the right. IP protections in place mm -hmm. for our technology and it's obviously really cool. what other things should we patent as we go. So that's helped in, in some of the stuff we do at Tenable now. So now, uh, given your background in, in, in all of that, Matt, um, how do you see vulnerability management evolving in the next five or, or ten years? Since you're the VP of strategy, right? Ooh, I want to ask you questions yeah. like that. <laughs> and you and I have had conversations, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm curious definitely. to see where you go with that. Yeah, like, I mean... E Vulnerability management and the collection of vulnerability data, you know, I, I've told a lot of people this. I think it's getting commoditized, right? I think we do a fantastic job of collecting them as a company, but data by itself has a certain value. 
And that value in the collection of vulnerability data is getting commoditized to an extent. So mm -hmm. I think what you'll see is in the base collection of vulnerability data, this continued pressure, pricing pressure from a commoditization standpoint, which is fine. It's expected. You know, we've been doing this for 15 years. Um, it's going to commoditize over time. Where it needs to go next is what you do with the data. It's not just data in the vulnerability. It's how do you correlate vulnerability information with other pieces of uh, the security posture? How does it relate? How do you take security state and tie that with security activity, analyze that, and make better decisions based on that information? So what I think you're going to see in the vulnerability management space is this continued emphasis on analytics and reporting and actionability of the results, not just about collecting a bunch of scan results mm -hmm. and publishing a report, because those reports... It's like how it interacts anymore. with everything else. Because it's, it's, it's it interesting the type of data that we, well, I say we as Tenable, yeah, yeah, we as Tenable collect, yeah. right? Right. And, and how that can be used and other. I'm like, there's some really cool things that we collect, but I feel like there's not enough process or uh, actions in the background to really act upon a lot of that data. Yeah. Like I've always said, it's interesting, there's sheer vulnerabilities that you can patch, right? Right. There's configuration things that we talked about that, you can go fix. But then there's this like whole other class of stuff. Like there was a listing of USB devices that was plugged into this host that there was the Bluetooth installed on this host. You know, there was this, there's this weird, port like weird, like weird classification. Right. Yeah. yeah weird stuff. And it's they funny. could be vulnerabilities. They could but be. Yeah. And most of the vulnerability scanners identify them as Information. Informational. And right? I mean, we do too to and, a certain and, extent. And yeah. A lot of people do. Where because, else do you put them? Well, it's not a vulnerability it's per not. se. It's a condition. But it yeah. could be a pathway or an attack yeah. path if you can correlate that with other information that's going on in the environment. So exactly. if you have network traffic and you see kind of interesting traffic going to that port – or if you see log information, I was say, logs right yeah, help. Shed then, when dimension, you bring right. all those dimensions together, and you can run analytics on top of it, mm -hmm. now you can say, "Oh, wait, it was Larry on a pen test, right. and he pulled my box, <laughs> right? Or whatever it <laughs> yep. was, yeah, yeah, or it was Korea who yeah, exactly, never, right. exactly, right. but you don't know, and and so there's a lot of information in the vulnerability scan results that have value in a broader analytics discussion. And that's where I think you'll continue to see us focusing more on it's, analytics it's an and actionability. It's definitely an evolution. Yeah. It's interesting. Definitely. You know, I, I hear Larry talk and I read articles and I think about, like, how I would do a pen test and I'm like, we could totally put all those pieces together, right? Like, we have visibility, for lack of a better term, into some of those areas. If we could only kind of piece that together more right. quickly... I feel like we could do a better job of detection. Yeah, I think, you know, with Security Center, we do a lot of that today. I think the, the next evolution is how do you visualize that and make it easy for somebody to actually go, that's my problem right there, mm -hmm. and i got to figure out how to stop that. Right. And, and You as, can't stop us. Right. <laughs> but, as, but as humans, we want to see things more visual. Absolutely. And I think as we get better <clears throat> analytics and better visualizations – we get better actionability. And, and I think that's obviously where the market's going to continue to trend. So, yeah, to kind of talk about trends, I mean, do you see a, a bigger trend into automation? How do you see the trends into these bigger vulnerabilities? Like We're going to use the term SSL, Carlos, I apologize. But, <laughs> like, how, where do you see some of those trends going? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the big kind of nirvana state for most organizations is this concept of, how do you automate the respond and protect mechanisms? Um, it's a big focus for us from a research perspective. And it is how do you take the data you have and shorten the window on yeah. what you do to respond to it, right? So the Anthem breach, I think, is an interesting mm. discussion, right? Absolutely. Right? That breach was there for hundreds of days, okay? And no one detected it. So what organizations are trying to do now is to say, the average is 204 days, <laughs> right? How do I get that down to 
30 four, days or, two, 40 hours. Or, or, or an hour or a minute, yeah. right? Yeah, 204 so, minutes, 204 seconds. Right. I, I need to speed that process up in yeah. the detection so that I can respond faster so I don't have so much damage or exfiltration of data in mm-hmm. the network. Because right. after and 24 hours, Larry has he, he's got less everything. than that. He's got domain credentials and he's got everything. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so Sometimes in the first 15 minutes of a pen test, right? Yeah. So my, my record is uh, about 22 minutes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we just did one. Uh, we just had our guys do one, and uh, we we actually had two separate teams on two different customers' networks attacking different different customers, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it was kind of the race. And one team was three hours, the other one was ninety minutes. Wow! And and so yeah. think about that: two hundred and four days to identify <laughs> the attack. <laughs> Sixty and minutes. And you guys yeah. are doing it in ninety minutes. Yeah. yeah. So that's the opportunity, and that's the drivers yep. to say. If I know I'm vulnerable and I know that I see funny activity going on, I have to be able mm-hmm. to respond Bond. in hours, not days, right? Yeah. And, and that's the challenge <laughs> in the Almost market, and months. that's the evolution that's going to have mm-hmm. to continue in our space. But that brings in a whole other set of issues that I don't think we are ready for, and that is trust, mm. right? How many of us got burned in the IPS days when we put that sucker into blocking mode? Right. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so that's my question. I was so never allowed to put it in blocking yeah, mode because <laughs> so man, I had this conversation earlier. Did, yeah. And those of us yeah. who did yeah. got burned, burned somewhere along so the way. So like, yeah. how do we automate safely to get that window down? Like you and I were talking. Like, do we wait till like people like us are just vintage? So folks as ourselves are, you know, we're playing golf and complaining about the government full time. Get off my lawn. <laughs> and yeah, and, but and let the next generation worry about implementing the next generation of security automation. Yeah, I mean there is a generational mm. thing here. So, so you're doing I the think. grumpy like old man thing, dude. No, right? no. Yeah. I'm d- well, yeah, I've got the grumpy old man thing going on, but it's like hipster, like pointy, and like <laughs> I- if I had done the it's wax, I would I would have had the the, the handlebars, the, the handlebars. Right. Yeah. But you you fall in the category like with Matt and I. Like we're skeptical because we've been burned by yeah, things but, like but IPS. No, no, uh, it was more of a. I, no, I don't think we need to wait for. We we I, need to be that next generation along with yeah, the next generation. Yeah, we, so, we need so to I, evolve. I agree. As an industry, we can't wait. Yeah. What I what I fear is that we won't get to Nirvana with our generation because so many of us got burned. Mm-hmm. It's either it's one of two things. Um, the way I described it to Paul earlier today is, our generation got burned, so we're a little shy, a little mm-hmm. trigger shy to mm-hmm. do something. Uh, the generation behind us is probably going to be a little more gung ho, but our management team on top of us, this is all foreign to them. Yeah, they never grew up the way we did in security, so Get they're off still my lawn. learning. Right. Man, I got yelled at for being on the lawn, and hey, what's a lawn? Right. <laughs> and, and, and so yeah. now what's happening is I think there's there is a it's going to be hard to build the trust with the executive team that's there in most corporations mm. that are older than us. I think we see the value in doing it, and we have to continue to drive to it. And I think the generation behind us are the ones that are going to actually go much more gung-ho into actually doing it. But again, it goes back to trust. If we can't sure. build trust in the data we're collecting, the analytics we're providing to allow them to make the right decisions, um, then they will never get to the point where they can automate the decisions. And I think it's that's funny. what we have to I get to. I see that now. You know, The generation behind us are like, well... We could just script the creation of cloud servers. Right. Like this. So take <laughs> yeah, Sean Malloy. Exa- yeah, exactly. So yeah. take our VP of, of, yeah. of cloud, right? Sean's a partial generation behind me. Um, he's just like, yeah, I'm just going to script all this stuff, and I'll spin up Anessa's cloud tomorrow, right? right. They're ready to and, automate all this and stuff. And, and if there's and a security what, and problem, and I'll say? automate it, and I'll script spinning up a new one. Right, exactly. Like, oh, and, you, and you know what I say? Ah, cloud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Larry refuses to host things in the cloud. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. It, it, the, the I hope you got a big hard drive on there. I do actually. <laughs> uh, two of them, as a matter of fact. If I, uh, I, like, I, I, I need help with my 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 you know ESXi server at my house. I'm like, dude, no cloud. He's like, no, nah, we, we can't. We can't. I can't yeah, do no, that. No, no, I'm yeah. kind of private, I'm, private. I'm a little more liberal. Wait, I'm wait. like, I'm like cloud okay. And then when like the newer guys, you know, like Chris yep. and, and Ashley and Nick are like. Dude, like we can sh- totally script the cloud. I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. See, now, now what do you see, think we're doing? All right, see, That's exactly. I, 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 what I, will, I will at least not say 
Get off my lawn! And you know, no cloud thing. See, I've got an ESXi server at home, so I've got private cloud. You've got your there private you cloud. <laughs> you're right. See, I've got cloud. You have yeah. got cloud. You create your own virtual private cloud. There exactly. You go. exactly. But yeah, I think and I've got a VPN, and I can get to my private cloud. It's a continual evolution for us, and it's and it is a trust thing. There's it no is. doubt about it. So, Matt, are you ready for the five questions? Uh, do my best. You're never you're never truly ready, ready. for five questions. No, I'm, I'm never right. ready. Three words to describe yourself. So. Uh, I try to be realistic uh, for a strategy guy. That's for that's a strategy guy, you're fairly realistic. I'll give you yeah, that. I'm yeah, I'm fairly realistic. You're, you're like fifty um, percent realistic. I yeah, think. Uh, um, <laughs> you have to be confident, and in, in I, I think I'm pretty confident in the decisions I make. And the last one is I am persistent. Uh, if anybody knows me, I am a persister. I am a persistent, persistent, realistic guy. threat. Yeah, wow, he is. <laughs> he, no, he he really came to me one day and he's like, I want to change all these things, and I'm like. Holy Dude, crap. what are you doing? You're on crack. <laughs> and then I walked in. T- I walked into Tenable, and people were like, "What are you thinking?" I'm like, and, wow. and Matt just kept like calling me and emailing me, and I'm like, "Okay, I'm like, all right, all right, all right, I'm on board now." I'm on board. <laughs> so he is persistent. He is persistent. I am persistent. Nice. So if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Uh, it would have to be um, either a crossbow or a bow and arrow. Nice. It's silent. It's if you wrote deadly. a book about yourself, what would the title be? I eventually figured it out. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Actually, second. It, it was interesting because he said, be, be the first one. Actually, I, I'm fine with being kind of a, a fast follower, so second. Because sometimes you go first, you get slapped. Yeah, you That's never true. know. You never and, know. And I'm not quite that aggressive, but I think a, a fast follower persistent. Is, is always persistent. good. Persistent. Yeah, persistence again. Um, and whoever registered the domain askgrabbygrabby.com, I have choice words for you that I won't <laughs> say. Uh, if you choose two celebrities to be your parents. Yeah. This is the hard one. Alive it, or it's dead. Actually, Alive so it's pretty dead. interesting. So when I came to Tenable, they said, Who do you, which famous person do you look like? So that made this question easy because it's Kevin Spacey. Because that's who kind of looks like me, so he could be my father, which means Robin Wright has to be my mother. There you go. The House of Cards for all, all those people <laughs> out right. there who don't. That's, watch a it. Yeah. that's a great show. Yeah, that's a great show. That's a great show. Oh well, thank you very much, Matt. You're going to stick around. We're going to talk about stories next. We're going to get a short break. Come back and talk about the stories for this week. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> 